<laughs> I haven't heard yet. Um, <clears throat> so there's a, quite a lot to talk about. Um, um, but one thing that I've noticed, and I'm sure people that have been around um, much longer than me, like Michael Arbib, have noticed that um, this thing goes in cycles. You know, Every 20 years, 25 years, a generation, we have a, a, um, a return to analog, low-level, sub-symbolic computing. Um, in between, we focus more on, on technical applications because we haven't really worked out how, um, how it really works. But we come back, and hopefully it's not a circle. Hopefully it's some kind of, some kind of spiral where there's a, a progress made um, every time we do a, a two-pi a two uh, circuit. And also, if it's a spiral, there are, are there going to be moments when there's discontinuities and we take off in a different direction. And there's a, which reminds me of, um, oh, so the overall uh, question is, how do we unite molecular synaptic and network physiology, probabilistic machine learning, and the physics of self-organization? That's the research project that um, I think is the important one to, to, that we have to follow up to try to tie things together. It's ambitious, but um, maybe there's something to say there. So here's uh, the human chromosome. And this is a, an example of a molecule which goes in the spiral, uh, has a linear direction and circular direction, and then takes off in different, uh, and it, it takes off in different directions as you go. Um, and the way that uh, if you look down in into the structure of this uh, chromosome molecule, what you see is that uh, the DNA at the top, where's the laser pointer? Where are we? OK. The DNA at the top is wrapped around uh, chromatin, which is a kind of protein, um, which is packed together into a structure like that, uh, which then forms these ribbons like that. And the ribbons form you know, ribbons made out of ribbons. And they go back and forth. And in the end, you have this nice uh, X-shaped thing called the chromosome. So there's clearly a lot of multi-scale structure in this, uh, in this uh, um, chromosome in the DNA. And in, it's, it's in the way that it is wrapped up in a three-dimensional structure. And um, if you look down at the detailed structure of the DNA and the chromatin, the protein that it wraps around, the uh, particular configurations of these proteins determine how the uh, DNA is folded in on itself. And, um, and the, which parts of the DNA are exposed to the, the, um, the cytoplasm, where the, the uh, water is and where the, pro the proteins are running around, that those are the parts of the protein which are available for expression. So this is a three-dimensional shape, and whichever part of the DNA is pointing outwards is the part of the DNA that can be read. So it's like a three-dimensional library. So that leads to a theory, which is what we're, which, what, what, I don't know if this theory is true, but I want to present it as theory number one. It may or may, or may not be true. That the hierarchical energy landscape of this DNA is a model of the hierarchy of cell types and species types. So when you move from a stem cell, which is an undifferentiated, uh, more sort of um, um, primordial shape for the DNA to a more differentiated cell, you have a particular different parts of this, the DNA facing outwards. And perhaps even species type, perhaps even the tree-like the tree -like shape of the energy landscape of the DNA, the particular minima that it can go into, even corresponds to, even maps onto something like the phylogenetic tree. So that's a theory. We don't have mathematics for it. It's a rather abstract. Um, but um, there are other theories, um, like Jerry was mentioning, this uh, ICA network that we worked on um, over 10 years ago, actually. Um, this is a theory which is more concrete and which there is mathematics for. And this is a theory where um, the network is a transformation going from some input variables, um, which are, in this case, an ensemble of natural, I can never see this thing, an ensemble of natural images. And we're building a statistical model of it by building a network, which is a transformation of uh, of um, uh, transformation of the of the image into a new coordinate system, and the the rows of this matrix which form the transformation form a representation a representational language for representing an ensemble of natural images, and so you're really building a uh, a um, um, can any, can I, can anybody see that? <laughs> I can't see anything. Use the pointer on your computer. <laughs> okay. Right. So there, yes. <clears throat> so here we have um, a statistical model, and it's made literally about, by this transformation, by the determinant of the weight matrix, and by the product of some terms which represent the slopes of the neurons' activity, which are these neurons U at the top of the screen. And with this, you get a representational language for the images. They look like that. 
Um, you get localized oriented um, filters of different, uh, s different spatial frequency, different location, uh, different orientation, and they, they tile the space of, of patterns. There are statistical language for those patterns. And if you perform some, uh, some, um, if you perform some variants of this, of this statistical model, you actually can get them, you can get these things to be arranged two dimensionally in, uh, uh, in a grid somewhat like or reminiscent of the topographic map of V1 where you see an orientation column with a high frequency and low frequency singularity in the map and continuous variation of spatial frequency and position of the cells as you move across the map. So this is literally supposed to be one of these mini columns, um, um, one of these, uh, you know, like you're looking across a sheet of cortex in a sense. It's a very abstract model, but it captures some of the essential uh, relationships in, that you see in V1 between the sensitivities of the cells. And this all comes from doing statistics on pixels. So it's an example of, of a, a kind of work which is trying to build representations on, from the bottom up uh, using unsupervised learning principles. Now, there's, so that's a theory. That's a theory that a mapping can be a probabilistic model of its inputs. And by adapting that mapping, we can get something sensible. Like we can get a good representation that may say something about what's happening in biology. Of course, the things that we're talking about here are these synaptic weights, which represent, you know, which, th those pictures, those filters you're looking at are like, you know, the values of these synaptic weights. These weights are, um, are protein complexes in, in reality, in, um, in real neural nets. This electron micrograph, this is pre two presynaptic boutons, little vesicles, postsynaptic density where all the proteins are, which uh, pick up the information that's con uh, whenever a vesicle fuses a membrane and releases neurotransmitter. So we're a long way from our treating you know, this system as a set of scalar val values, WIJs, to really the complexity that we see in the detailed molecular and cellular biophysics. You have many other things there. You have, for example, the uh, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, which is a membrane system that goes throughout the dendrites. And you have various apparatus here, which is reading and expressing genes and shuttling receptors to and from uh, the membrane, changing the synaptic weights. A lot of molecular machinery of plasticity. So um, to connect those two ideas, well, we had the DNA and we had the, sy the synapse. Um, a hypothesis from Michael Berridge at Cambridge is that the synapse, here's the bouton, this is a dendrite, and this is the cell body, that the calcium comes in um, and uh, sends a little calcium wave along the endo endoplasmic reticulum. Calcium comes in at the nucleus, and this is a separate wave from, like, electrotonus, from voltage spread in dendrites. Two minutes? Ooh, OK. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Jerry says four. So I, I'll, I'll really have to charge through anyway. Um, but the, the message here is that there's that you you know while while I'm speaking, you know, EPSPs are happening in your neurons. That calcium has been spread along your dendrites, and your and your gene expression is being uh, altered in a dynamic fashion um, all the time. So there is a pathway of information all the way from uh, the synaptic down to the nuclear. And there's similarly a network within the synapse. This is a Morgan Sheng slide, shows different proteins in the postsynaptic density. And they're calcium domains of about four nanometer size, which are, uh, um, which are controlling the uh, uh, messages flowing back and forth between these proteins. So, just, so the message is that calcium is to networks of proteins, what voltage is to network of synapses, what spike timing is to networks of neurons, and what high-frequency oscillations are to networks of low-frequency oscillations. So there's this multi-scale structure of networks within networks in biology. And even the, neuron, the neural input to a, a dendrite is really a mapping between a neuron, uh, a neuronal signal, and something which read out at a synaptic signal. It's not a mapping between neurons and neurons. So it's an inter-level mapping from neural, value, neural level to the synaptic level, which is over-complete mapping from n to order n squared variables. So if we have this kind of graphical structure in biology where we have networks within networks, um, how do we um, connect that with our unsupervised learning ideas? And the idea uh, is that uh, there is a reductionist hierarchy, and there's a multi-resolution uh, state vector. Here you have a state vector for macromolecules, for protein complexes. For, like synapses, axon hillock, for neurons and for creatures, and there are signals going back and forward at each, at each level, words, spikes, voltage, and calcium. And there are downward arcs. Um, spikes uh, can influence voltage, which then creates spikes. There are upward arcs. Um, I can, spikes can create behavior, which creates spikes in other people's heads. So there's, 
there are upward arcs and downward arcs, and there's different ways for spikes com to communicate with other spikes, whether it's within the cell or between people. Um, and then there's an the information flow between um, all these levels. Um, and we have something similar in physics, where uh, we also have, an, this is an example of coarse graining as we go up. All the information, in he all the information here is contained here, and, and so on as we go down. In physics, there's a principle of renormalization group where you clump variables together and you work out relationships between the statistics at different levels. And this is our most successful physical theory giving rise to quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics. But uh, it doesn't work in biology because biology has this modular structure that we're talking about, these separate levels. It's not scale-free. So we need something that works for this, not for the scale-free system. And um, so this is the kind of idea I probably need to finish up, and there really isn't time to go into the details of any of this. Um, but the kind of model which I'm trying to build together with uh, some of me, my colleagues is um, a model where um, we are using this, uh, re this um, represent representational resource that exists in, at the networks beneath, right? And so the example is um, kinetic equations, for example. Here's an analogy between the independent component analysis algorithm and what we would call perhaps something le levels learning or something like that. In ICA, you have a mapping from X to Y, and that the Jacobian of that mapping is a probabilistic model of the input. Now, in this levels learning idea, we have a mapping uh, from input to output. It's a dynamical network, and the flows between the nodes of the network. This is a kinetic scheme, and the, and the uh, different states of Y are different, like, for example, different energy minima for a, for a, for a population of proteins. Um, and these flows, there's an order of N squared flows between the nodes of this Markov process for N nodes. And the, the Jacobian of for how those flows are um, affected by the input is a, a statistical model, which is a dynamic statistical model, statistical model dependent on internal state. So I really need to finish up. but. Um, what I'm trying to say here, regardless, I mean, you wouldn't have got much of a sense from uh, that network about what, about what is, is happening, but, but the overall um, high-level um, picture is that the power of biology comes, because the, the contention is that the power of biology comes from this nested level structure, that there isn't a functionist cutoff level in neuroscience the same way that we engineer in the computer where we use 100,000 electrons to implement one bit. There's really a continuous flow of information up and, down the hierarchy, up and down the hierarchy. And if you don't believe that, then you need to consider things like um, a single photon can make the difference of, between life and death for a dark adapted creature uh, because a single photon, as Barlow showed in 1972 in the cat retina, can give rise to a single spike. And a single spike can amplify through emergence throughout the network to give rise to macroscopic behavioral changes. Uh, and we know this because creatures can escape from a predator on the basis of very small, uh, in very low light levels. So there is um, a, a, uh, a, in biology, there is the capacity to amplify information all the way from the microscopic, even from the quantum, uh, you, you might argue, uh, up to the macroscopic, and to set boundary conditions from the microscopic that access certain forms of certain kinds of microscopic information. So perhaps reward, which might be better viewed as a, uh, a, um, a network phenomenon, a social network, uh, an associative memory and representation are perhaps treated as, best treated as these interlevel phenomena. And if, if I'm right, we just need to get the Jacobians right and get the algorithms right, and then uh, we'll be able to demonstrate this. So I'd like to thank Jerry, of course, for funding it. Uh, my work and uh, the work of Killian Kupsel, who's right there. And this is uh, the gang of us uh, at the uh, Redwood uh, Center on Berkeley, and there's Bruno Olshausen, who's uh, taken on uh, the uh, lion's share of, uh, of um, organization and uh, leading us. So thanks. Thank